Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining NUIX and KPMG for a discussion of the EU General Data Protection Regulation, Understanding Compliance of GDPR. I'm Roxana Frederick, Director of Advisory Services for NUIX and the moderator for our webinar today. A bit of housekeeping. We're going to be asking polling questions throughout the presentation, so please take a few seconds to respond so our panel can focus their comments. So today's agenda. As you all know, GDPR goes into effect May of 2018. It's a demanding regulation requiring significant effort by organizations. So today our panel will discuss and outline the requirements of GDPR, the approach for complying with GDPR, a framework for data identification, a case study from a life sciences company, and finally, how technology plays an integral part of the process. Our esteemed panel today includes Jennifer Abrahamson, a Director of Strategy and Governance at KPMG. She's joined by David Shin, a Director of Advisory at KPMG, and Brian Tumler, Information Governance Product Manager from NUIX. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Roxanne. So, yes, yeah, Jennifer Abrahamson. I actually rejoined KPMG about two years ago. I was working and living abroad in uh, Switzerland, helping organizations over there in anticipation of some of the GDPR requirements that were going to come out, and now help clients here in the U.S. as we start to uh, prepare for uh, readiness for GDPR compliance in 2018. I'll hand it to David Chin. Thanks, Jen. Hello, my name is David Chin. I'm a director with KPMG Cyber Practice based out of Dallas. I'm in my ninth year with the firm. My background is technical and for the last 12 years have been specializing in digital investigations, e-discovery, and data identification. Whether it's scanning thousands of endpoints for malware, collecting thousands of data targets in support of litigation or government investigations, or searching thousands of data targets for personal information in a company's network. These three services have a common theme that is they involve collecting or scanning large volumes of data, processing them into understandable formats and analyzing. I've been using Nuix since 2010 and it's become my go-to solution to help our clients effectively, quote unquote, find needles in a haystack. Two years ago, KPMG and Nuix formalized our relationship with a strategic business alliance where we can now offer best-in-class services and software. In the last two years since the alliance, I've been helping lead KPMG's data identification services where we're helping our clients identify and remediate company-sensitive and PII, PHI type data. Brian? Yeah, and I'll jump in at the end. My name is Brian Timler. I'm a, an information governance product manager at Nuix. I also have a background in helping people with massive amounts of poorly organized, unstructured content, figure out how to do things like uh, implement ECRM systems or clean up stuff or put stuff into records categories. Um, and then, of course, the compliance side of things. So my role at the moment is to help make sure that all of the various NUIX tools to help index large volumes of content and address the needs of compliance regulatory type issues such as GDPR and a variety of other use cases. Well, let's begin. Jen, do you want to lead off? So the, the concept of data privacy and data protection is not new. Um, it originates as early as, or can be traced back as early as 350 BC. Interestingly enough, the US is actually the first to uh, introduce privacy laws as early as the uh, late 1890s, with then the establishment of the Fair Information Practice Principles in the 1970s which really established the basis for some of the privacy principles that would be carried forward in regulations in the future. The EU then picked up in the 1980s, really focused on the protection of individuals, so a bit of a different focus than the U.S. laws and had been in the past, and then with the EU Data Protection Directive in 1995. The U.S. and the EU then established a safe harbor agreement to allow for the free uh, transfer of data between the two countries, which is 
which was then invalidated with the uh, revelation um, from Snowden around U.S. mass surveillance 15 years later. And then on top of that, the EU has continued to enhance some of the requirements with the GDPR and really, you know, ta trying to tackle and, and focus on, you know, what technology, um, globalization, the increased collection of data that uh, is going on with all these things combined and trying to make sure and keep up with those impacts on uh, individuals' rights to privacy. If we go to the next slide, so GDPR in a nutshell, there are 99 articles in the, the GDPR, uh, with 39 of those really being the key articles and really focused on uh, the ability of organizations to have proper record keeping around the data that they collect, how it's used, um, and where it's going and coming from. GDPR also establishes significant um, teeth in the sense of financial implications uh, if uh, an organization is non-compliant with global fines of up to 4% of, or excuse me, fines of up to 4% of global revenues. Um, it also uh, enhances the concept of accountability in terms of record keeping, so real-time understanding of what data an organization has, um, what's really personal and sensitive data, how it's collected, how it's used, whether uh, the organization is required to collect all that data to, for the intended purpose, um, and uh, also around retention and, and general safeguards. It also extends the concept of what is personal data um, to include uh, automated data um, or data that is um, used in conjunction with other data that can identify an individual. It further enhances the individual's right to privacy around um, data portability, um, the, the concept of the right to be forgotten, um, access to an individual, the right, individual's right to access to their data, and then really enforcing the explicit consent concept for uh, providing data. From a governance perspective, we also have the establishment of the data protection officer who needs to act as um, more an independent function within the organization to help the organization um, steer towards GDPR compliance. We have enhanced requirements around the timing of breach notification being 72 hours. The privacy impact assessment, which is required for organizations where they have higher risk processing of personal data. Uh, what parts of the organization that would have the highest impact as it relates to personal data, so oftentimes third-party management, uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, depending on your industry, product development, customer operations, and then we have cross-border data transfers, so understanding where you're collecting data from and where it's going to, and if it's going across border, then understanding how that data is being shared and making sure that has the right protections in transfer. And lastly, um, the concept of privacy by design and default. So making sure that privacy is not an afterthought, but is built into the design and uh, concept of processes, technologies, um, and other operations within the organization. Jen, if I can interrupt, why don't we take a polling question right now? Great. So if everyone's dialed in, we have a polling question just trying to understand what industry you are aligned to. Um, we've listed some options in the polling questions for you. And Jen, you mentioned that the privacy impact assessment differs slightly based upon the type of industry that's being evaluated. Yeah, so privacy depends on what parts of your organization deem to have higher risk processing. So um, if you're in technology and you're creating software, you're going to have it from the product development and product engineering aspect and financial services um, from, you know, the onboarding aspect of clients. So these are some of the, the, the different uh, areas that it could be. So it looks like we have quite a few from the technology space. Um, and the second up would be financial services, followed by industrial products, then telecommunication media, and automotive. So interesting mix, great. Should we go to the next slide, Jen? Yep, that'd be great, Roxanne. 
So with all the substantial impacts that GDPR has um, on our clients, KPMG is, is actively involved in helping and well positioned to help our clients on this journey towards GDPR compliance. We are recognized as the leader in the cyber space given our uh, frameworks and methodologies that we use to help clients on this journey. Um, we also actively contribute to uh, various thought leadership materials as it relates to data protection and data privacy, uh, data loss, and privacy compliance. And then we further enhance um, that offering with partnering uh, with the right partners in order to help provide a, a collective uh, service to our clients, including NUIX for data inventory, given that um, one of the key and most challenging areas that organizations, and also time intensive areas for organizations, is really around understanding and inventory and developing um, real-time record keeping of the data that they collect um, in order to reach GDPR compliance. So KPMG's methodology is based on the generally accepted privacy principles, and that frames um, our, what we refer to as our um, privacy cube or privacy framework. So across, our privacy framework looks across the organization. Uh, you know, privacy is not, and GDPR compliance is not just about the privacy function itself. It really is a combination of all aspects of the organization. So, um, you know, we talked about third party management, we talked about breach and the timelines to respond, we've talked about, um, you know, security and the right to access. So, uh, we talked about, you know, inventory and controls and procedures in order to handle data correctly. All of these um, different aspects are touched across the organization and therefore require cross-functional coordination and effort in order to achieve GDPR compliance. So in going through the, the KPMG model and, and methodology, really looking at, okay, how does the governance and operating model define in order to achieve GDPR compliance? What's been considered in terms of the need for um, the DPO role? Where does that sit in the organization? Then looking at understanding what data the organization has, um, inventorying that and understanding what is personal data, what is sensitive data, um, and then further uh, managing and identifying regulatory changes that may impact uh, the governance and uh, requirements and controls um, down the road. We then have um, the establishment of um, an identification of risks and controls. And again, those privacy risks can uh, maybe defined by privacy, but the controls themselves may sit throughout the organization, um, whether it's uh, for um, within you know the mergers and acquisitions process as it relates to privacy, uh, whether it's in the HR process as we look at how recruitment is done or onboarding is done. You then have information lifecycle management, so that's understanding. What are the controls and, and what data is collected um, at the point of collection? What its intended use is and purpose? So, you know, applying the concept of privacy data minimization through to how data is transferred or shared and who can access it, where is it stored, how long is it retained, and what are the policies around retention, and then from there to uh, destruction. Establishing then a common set of uh, privacy policies that govern how the organization manages um, privacy risk and um, achieves regulatory compliance. Then looking at it from a cultural change perspective, and that's establishing processes, procedures, and also technology that can help enable overall compliance, enable uh, control effectiveness um, and risk reduction. Looking at security for privacy, so that's data handling controls, whether that's uh, access, how access is managed, um, encryption, for example. You have third party management, so what are the rule uh, requirements around assessing a third party relationship to understand um, what data will be shared with that third party, what controls they have in place, uh, record keeping around um, those relationships and the data that they have access to. Now lastly, looking at kind of the bottom half of the cube around the education and governance, 
um, aspects as well, so training and awareness and making sure that the organization as a whole uh, understands its obligations around um, privacy and data protection, including GDPR requirements. Um, as well as perhaps enhanced training for some of the higher risk areas within the organization. Monitoring the effectiveness of the controls that have been put in place to address the privacy risks across the various CUBE elements. And then lastly around uh, incident management and um, how privacy is engaged, making sure that um, response can be adhered to within the 72 hour window. So I think if we, in the kind of strategically placed in the cube is the information lifecycle uh, management. So one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that GDPR stresses is really the record keeping concept um, and having that real time record keeping. And again, um, some of the, the challenges that we see with the organizations that we're dealing with is that GDPR is also requiring not just the, the record keeping aspect, but a whole um, shift in terms of culture and how the organization works together. And a lot of that being rooted in, in the data that the organization collects and uh, retains and uses. Roxanne, if we go to the next slide. So GDPR has the expectation that an organization knows what data um, it has. Um, again, this is where we see the, the biggest the most questions um, from clients, uh, also for requests for support, it's a lot around um, understanding, uh, helping organizations understand what data they have, and that's where partnering with uh, NUIX um, helps support that uh, effort to or uh, journey with clients as they re reach towards GDPR compliance. It also goes to show the, the requirement and cross-functional alignment that's needed and that cultural shift because with data being rooted as the basis for understanding what you have and what you're collecting and how establishing those real-time inventories, privacy then can determine have, with that understanding of what the organization has and what it collects, what the, the risk threshold is from a privacy perspective for the organization and then provide that guidance so that information security has clarity on what is important to the organization that needs to have certain security controls applied to it. So all of these functions combined um, help to address the GDPR requirement around um, the use, knowing what you have, record keeping, real-time inventories, and guardrails for uh, data protection um, and privacy. With that, I'll hand it over to Brian. Great, thank you. Thank you, Roxana, for switching slides. Just um, in the transition from the sort of the, the practice and the definition of the framework into the actual practical application, which David's going to talk about, wanted to throw in a quick slide that sort of, I think, emphasizes the biggest reason that all of us are here in the first place is just the massive amounts of volume that are being created on a daily basis. Uh, all of these data options play a role in how much content we have, how much we have to find, how much we have to know where it is. At Nuix, this is one of the big focus points of a lot of our development and product strategies is the understanding that we not only have to deal with extremely large volumes in a variety of different locations, but there's a lot of source data formats that we have to figure out how to uh, extract data out of, and a lot of file formats to be able to open up to be able to extract the data so that you can build the classifications and build the understanding that you need. We know that from a theoretical standpoint, if you were to have a policy and the policy uh, required certain amount of, uh, as you saw in the previous slides, education and training and direction and practice and all the other bits and pieces to go along with it. If you don't have the technology to help be compliant, uh, then you're missing an important part of the compliance and therefore you're just immediately out of compliance if you have the policy without a way to show that you're adhering to it. So um, obviously our goal is, is really to meet the needs of large organizations that are dealing with this, mostly because as you saw the the fees and fines for falling out of compliance or not being able to respond quickly enough can be quite substantial. So we want to make sure that we can get you to the right data at the right time with the right details that you need uh, to help respond. And with that, I'll pass it over to David. Thanks, Brian. It's uh, definitely more often the case than not that our clients struggle with this data growth. You can't govern or protect it if you don't know what and where it is. I Imagine a lot of the companies represented on this webcast are having these same struggles. I've not had a single client tell me, yes, David, we know exactly where 
what data we have and where to store. Uh, especially in the semi-structured and unstructured repositories, the quote-unquote dark data. I do see a lot of our clients beginning to address these issues, whether it's protecting personal, sensitive, confidential data from cyber attacks or insider threats, or complying with regulations like PCI, HIPAA, GLDA, and now GDPR. But what's the right solution? Really, it depends on the type of data you collect, process, transfer, your company's risk appetite, industry, and overall data protection cyber maturity. Companies have turned to us in Newix to help them tackle this problem to gain better insight into their data environments and help them help to more effectively govern, protect, and utilize these critical business assets. Whether it's turning over every stone or taking a more strategic risk-based approach. For our data identification case study, our example involves a global healthcare life sciences company. During a, an internal audit, they discovered that there were personal, sensitive, and confidential information being stored on file shares. As the internal audit group began to ask more questions, they quickly realized that getting the answers were not so easy. For example, how many shares are in my environment, or what is the total volume? Due to the global scale and size of their infrastructure, years of mergers and acquisitions, disparate legacy systems, et cetera, it would take months to get counts and volumes. By the time they got the numbers, they were already outdated. The company engaged KPMG and Newix to help them develop an automated solution to search, classify, and remediate personal, sensitive, and confidential information from their file shares. We worked with the company to understand their current data protection policy taxonomies. We worked with their information governance and legal teams to review the policy taxonomies and develop a rules engine to automatically classify these sensitive information. We worked with their global information security and IT teams to strategically deploy new servers to data centers around the world, gain appropriate access, and ensure our solution met all their security requirements. There were lessons learned during the course of the project, for sure. But we were able to help them successfully remediate personal, sensitive, and confidential data using a scalable, bottom-up data inventory classification system. This ensured compliance with their company data privacy policies in their file share environment. We helped them design, implement, execute a continuous monitoring system. At the conclusion of our project, we assisted with training and documentation for a transition of the company to take over. During the course of the project, we provided weekly status updates. Team members and key stakeholders were able to get real-time updates through our web front-end dashboard. In addition to identifying and remediating data, we were able to provide additional value. We ran redundant, obsolete, trivial, or what we call rot analysis based on metadata collected during the project. We expanded our collection classification schema to update their manage knowledge management system. We even assisted during an incident where we scanned an affected subnet to conclusively determine no personal data was breached in their file share environment during the incident. Although this project preceded the official release of GDPR rules, I think the work that we did uh, on this project, the company is now in much better position for com GDPR compliance. On the next slide, this slide uh, describes our data identification framework, which outlines the activities involved with what we like to call bottom-up inventory. It's actually scanning the data and identifying information that we're looking for. We call it a framework instead of a methodology because it is not a strict set of rules and processes, but rather activities providing structure and direction. Every environment is similar and at the same time different. Bottom-up inventory can be a little overwhelming with all the moving parts and many stakeholders involved. The framework helps guide the process regardless of the size of company, number of different repositories, or stakeholders. The main components of the framework are fairly straightforward. The first one, you have identified data repositories you want to scan, develop search rules. In this case, that would be identifying EU personal data. 
scan the repositories, identify, classify the scan data, and then remediate. So when you get into the activities that it becomes very granular, requiring lots of coordination, project management, and technical skill. For example, I'll take the first component, identify data repositories. Going back to our case study, there were hundreds of thousands of file shares in scope. We needed to coordinate with the asset management team to compile our initial list of shares and monitor for new additions. Rather than scan shares randomly, we consulted with all the stakeholders to prioritize based on risk rankings and high yield, i.e. start with targets that require, for example, 30% effort to accomplish 70% yield rather than vice versa. We worked with IT to understand network architecture, connectivity between hundreds of VLANs. We also ensured that, ne that Nuix in one data center was not scanning shares in other data centers. We also worked with the information security team to ensure we had the appropriate access to all the folders and subfolders in scope. I won't go into detail for each component. I could probably you know, go on through the entire webcast. So if anyone has any questions regarding any, any of the other individual components, please uh, feel free to ask a question during the Q&A period. Maybe someone is working on a data identification project, would love to hear about your approach, what's working well, what's not. Lastly, you'll notice the diagram is circular, and that's because we intend this to be a continuous monitoring, a continuous process of monitoring. It's not real-time monitoring monitoring like your traditional DLP, but it is continuous monitoring in that repositories are continuously scanned with the ability to set frequency. With each successive scan, you only search files that have been created, modified since the last scan, which makes rescans much quicker. David, is this a good time to ask another question of the audience? Sounds like a great idea. So um, this one is regarding the efforts that people are taking and whether they've started this process. So let's take a couple of minutes and let people have a, an opportunity to answer. I can read David, it out what are you seeing you're when you're out there speaking to clients? Are, are people quite along in the process or starting the process? I think that uh, they're, they're in between starting the process and having things uh, work. And I think a lot of people are um, struggling with uh, the data growth that we just mentioned, definitely. Uh, there are so many different repositories, different stakeholders, um, and obviously the, the growth of data. Okay, closing the poll. Yeah, it seems like, you know, 63% are, are definitely starting and, and no 37. I think that's kind of in line with um, what we're seeing out in the field. Yeah, from a Nuix perspective, I'll, just, I'll also point out that I think there's a, uh, we have a number of uh, business activities going on in the in EMEA, and obviously they're much more concerned and interested in paying attention to this kind of thing. I think in the United States, unless you're particularly told by your European side that this is something you need to pay attention to, I think it might be slipping off the radar of some US-based companies, and definitely worth looking into and figuring out where you need to be uh, in response to it, because even though it's a directive from the EU, it is definitely something that impacts American companies as well. Yeah, maybe that 37% of the no's are maybe more U.S.-based companies. Yep. So, Roxanne, on, the, on uh, slide, the next slide. So this slide is, uh, talks about a crucial component of our framework, and it's the development of search rules. And uh, this was one of the lessons learned during our project. Initially, initial, initially, our approach was using a traditional e-discovery search methodology, basically filtering out non-user-based files, such as system files, and then next using search terms to classify the remaining files. There were the usual pains from this approach First, the search terms were producing a high number of false positives, and although we were processing over one terabyte a day, 
due to the high target volume, we wanted to optimize this. Based on the, the lessons learned, we developed a new approach to our classification rules engine. It encompasses aggregating various data points, for example, active directory information, employee history records, repository access logs, asset management records, records retention policy, legal hold records, etc., cetera, to, to be able to cross-correlate with the data targets to get a better understanding of the data. This allows us to apply classic classifications even before scanning. It allows us to target high-risk data targets for priority searching or using advanced searching methods like natural language processing or machine learning. For example, uh, there may be a file sitting on a, on a share that was created over seven years ago and has not been modified or accessed since. The file is not on legal hold and obviously not actively used for business purposes. Should we spend resources to scan, search, apply NLP machine learning? So these are kind of some of the things that we can use some smart, uh, strategic, risk-based approaches to uh, scanning and identifying data. Especially with the large volumes of data, you don't, you really don't have, you're not in position to scan all the hundreds of terabytes of data in your environment. So you kind of have to take a, a very smart approach to, a smart strategic approach to identification. You know, another example is that we could uh, risk rank, rank data targets that are regularly accessed by business units handling personal data or business units interacting with EU parties. At the, the core of our classification rules engine is NUIC. There's an old adage, garbage in, garbage out. At KPMG, we've been using NUIC since 2010. We process thousands of terabytes of data using NUIC. Its patented parallel processing engine allows us to quickly chunk through data with speed and precision. It's, uh, one of its unique features is, is its processing engine that does not rely on third-party middleware, but actually, actually searches files at the binary level. It supports thousands of file formats, which is especially important when searching through unstructured, semi-structured data. I, I noticed there are some questions that are popping up in the, the chat. I don't know if we address those now or should we wait till during the QA session? David, we can uh, address them at the end of the presentation because perhaps we'll uh, have somebody, you know, speak to them before we get done. So that's all perfect. right with you. Yeah, no, perfect. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Brian who will talk more in depth about NUIC. Thank you, David. Next slide, Roxana. So uh, at the core of everything that NUIX does is our NUIX engine. The NUIX engine, basically what it is, is a, a very sophisticated load balancing parallel processing tool that goes and looks at whatever data source you're pointing it at, and it starts inventorying the pieces of content, digital uh, content that it finds in that location. It could be a shared drive, it could be an email system, it could be a PST with emails with Word documents embedded, it could be a cloud source or any number of other uh, locations. The new extension can also be uh, replicated and run simultaneously in multiple locations to find data wherever it happens to reside. What it does is when it finds a piece of content is it pulls out the text and metadata. So this is looking at the box on the top left of this screen. It pulls out hashes, so the, the size of the file, so you compare duplicates and near duplicates. It does uh, all the content, all the metadata, pulls out some similarity shingles, basically allowing you to do things like similarity clusters to find content that's like other content, but not necessarily identical. Pulls out named entities, which are basically regular expressions. So looking for number patterns, things that might be useful in classification uh, bits and pieces. And then any other piece of information that might be useful in any kind of file object that's out there. Like David said, we've got uh, over a thousand file types. One of our most recent additions is the ability to find all of the text that can be uh, transcribed out of an audio file. So if that's part of your class classification process, we can find that data and add that to the, to the corpus of uh, index data that we're pulling out of the files. The real value in this more than anything else is that the more 
file types that you can see and the more data you can extract out of every file type, the better your classifications and the more accurate your classifications can be to get what you're trying to get to. Um, upon that engine, which is really the core of all of our products, we've got a number of different tools addressing specific use cases. So these are the windows on the right-hand side. Um, the majority of our uh, uh, efforts in the United States are around e-discovery. So there's a lot of large uh, e-discovery service providers and corporations using this for an e-discovery purpose. You can see why if you're looking at all your data and you wanted to find something matching a certain date frame with certain custodians, with certain topics, it's the perfect application for this. We obviously have a number of other places where we use these tools in investigations, in cybersecurity, in uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm responsible for in information governance. So a number of tools focused on specific use cases. There's also a lot of classification capabilities in it. So uh, topic modeling, uh, Bayesian classification for uh, 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 classifying things into records categories or finding other similarity type clusters of information. And obviously the other big value to this is the more data you can get out of different data sources, the better. So we can look at email systems, file shares, archives, databases, all of the stuff on the left-hand side, bottom corner of this is what we extract data out of. Um, like I said, we've got a number of tools. Uh, we're gonna talk to basically at a high level what some of them do conceptually as we go through this. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is the data that we're capturing and why do we do this? So next slide, Roxana. So obviously this is not necessarily just a definition of GDPR, but you'll find that what you define as what you need to protect in your data uh, can vary from use case to use case. The general concept more than anything, anything else is that you take either a single element of your data classification or multiple elements added together to build whatever it is that you think is particularly worth protecting or securing, or in some cases, if you're part of the data identification process and remediation wanting to get rid of, what makes up a piece of garbage. So these classifications can be used in a number of ways. You can see, for example, a personal ID form might be something that you're looking for, but if it's a personal ID form that happens to be on a health record, then you know that it also applies to um, a records category for uh, HR forms. Um, there's a number of different use cases for each of these different classifications, but you use all of these elements from the data that we've extracted from the index. Um, the, it's, it's something that's near and dear to my heart from an information governance perspective, mostly because uh, each of the major use cases that we see in IG, from mergers and acquisitions to compliance to records management to ECRM, um, they all have times where some things get classified rather easily because they happen to have, for example, a credit card number, therefore it's risky. And some of them are much more nuanced and, and need a, a separate level and a depth of, of classification to, to really target and understand what that piece of content might be. So as you can see, all of this stuff counts as stuff that's we consider to be sensitive or private or risky or valuable. Uh, and that's really why we want to try and classify these things from an information governance perspective. Next slide, please. So as David uh, said, a big, huge part of the GDPR uh, regulations are to know where the privacy data is held within your organization. Um, once again, near and dear to my heart as from an IG practitioner, that you're, we're not the only people that are concerned with that kind of thing. So you'll find that uh, you know if you're trying to figure out where all the HR documents are because they've got privacy information, somebody else in your organization is a records manager and is trying to find all the HR documentation so they can get rid of the content that's expired, which is a huge part of reducing your risk for GDPR, is to find the stuff that is beyond its uh, its retention expiration date. Any number of the other use cases that we talked about are gonna really have a, a, a severe need to try and find content, especially if you're a large organization with data spread over multiple systems, uh, multiple platforms, multiple geographic locations. Um, so lo locating and classifying the sensitive information is a big part of that, but the second part is to say, why is this data where it is and what can we do about it? So if you're, if you're concerned about risk-related or private-related data, in an unsecured fashion, there's a number of ways you can look at it to say, well, why is this actually happening? Uh, is this something that's uh, occurred on a one-time basis where it was accidentally released? Is it something that we didn't know was coming in or is it we know that it was coming in and we know that it's in a protected and secured location? Um, obviously, understanding where that data is uh, opens up the doors also to the, the retention, to the cybersecurity, to all the other 
uh, use cases, lifecycle management, and various other things. Uh, finally, remediation. If you just know where your content is and you know that it's protected, that's not necessarily always going to be good enough, depending upon the type of regulation that you're addressing and what you're trying to do with it. So um, just leaving it where it is may not be the right answer. Sometimes you need to um, hide it away somewhere. Sometimes if it's garbage, you can delete it. Sometimes if it's an expired record, you can delete it. Uh, you can copy things to a safe location. You can compress and encrypt and secure content in any number of ways. So uh, it's it's more than just finding, more than just understanding, but also the ability to do something about that when the time comes. Um, and I think we're ready for a, another survey. Perfect, Brian. So let's talk a little better. Let's get a, a feel for people's goals with regard to the maturity of their GDPR uh, compliance efforts. And also keep in mind when you're responding to this, if you were to put low because you haven't addressed the GDPR, if you do have abilities to find other private content, regardless of the regulation that's prompting it, then you're further along than you think. There's actually some good value and ways to leverage those workflows, work processes, and activities to make that happen. And that's a large part of what the methodology from KPMG is all about. That's a great point, Brian. Uh, so it looks like we're getting on the way there. We're not quite there yet, but we're doing good. So that's that's a good sign that we're moving in the right direction. If you're low and you need more help for figure out what your next steps are, this is uh, the people on the the other people on this call are the great people to find out where you need to go next from a, um, a process and framework perspective. So feel free to reach out to them. All right, next slide is. So I'm just going to show you a few views of some of the tools. I don't want to talk too much about the technology itself uh, and specifically what it's called, but just wanted to give you an idea that, um, as we mentioned, knowing where your data is, is is a very important first step. Being able to build those classifications is, is valuable, but this is sort of opening up the door to um, a variety of different ways to look at things. This is a web-based review and analytics tool. It's a dashboard that you can build with any number of different views in it. Um, to show you what I mean by different use cases, how they all might tie together, you'll notice on this slide on the top left, we're looking at the volume of content over time. Uh, there are three major spikes in that content. So there's large volumes of content that were produced and saved onto this particular file share uh, at some point in time. Very often those types of files are related to a single project. Uh, they're probably all going to have the same retention period. If they've got privacy data, they're going to have the same type of privacy data across the entire collection. So finding spikes in content is an important part of the remediation process. Uh, eliminating those spikes by protecting and preserving them really drastically rem removes risk in a large way from GDPR uh, breach concerns with very, very little effort. If you had to go each and individual, every individual file, that can be a very tedious, long involved process. But if you can group your decisions together and make them broader and, and more available, that helps a lot. The second chart on the right is showing you different value classifications that come as part of the tools. These are things that we work with on the KPMG side for their data identification for um, low value content remediation, basically defensible deletion or what I like to call tar targeted deletion. <clears throat> it's things like temporary files of stuff that people have identified as drafts that are over a certain period of time, that kind of thing. Uh, once again, if you can get rid of stuff because it has no business value, then it doesn't sit there presenting a risk from breach or escape. And that's really one of the biggest messages that I think I want to bring to the table with this particular view. On the bottom left, you can see a map that's showing you the XY coordinates of what we've extracted out of photographs. Um, that can be XY coordinates from any number of other files. If you wanted to somehow map a specific type of content to know where it was located and does it represent data that's been transferred over a national boundary. The next classification is showing you volumes of records classifications and records categories. And the bottom right is showing you the volume of duplication that showed up on that share. So keep in mind that if you do have duplicates of your GDPR sensitive private data, um, that just re represents twice as much data as you need to be concerned about than if you got, didn't get rid of the, the duplicate. So having a duplicate analysis and understanding how to reduce that volume can be extremely important in this. Next slide, and I'm going to start speeding up so that we have time for questions at the end. This is our, our core flagship product that allows you to have massive amounts of data in a database table to allow you to do the simple one-click filtering to find the data that really matches what you're trying to find and build relationships. So in this case, we're showing relationships of conversations to people. So if one of those pieces of content had something that was private, 
uh, knowing that there are other emails in that thread that might have spread that piece of privacy data uh, to different locations might be an important part of what you're trying to find. So finding relationships um, about where the content is, uh, what might be related to it, what languages they're in, the various regular expressions and pattern matches that we find in the content, all of that can be explored through this product. Uh, on the next slide, I'll show you some of the stuff that we're building, some of the later developments um, in distributing the engine. This is, I think, one of the more significant parts of the GDPR is uh, with the sensitive data finder tool, you can build up these complex uh, rules to find a specific piece of content, but more importantly, you can put that engine local to wherever the data might be coming in or leaving your organization. It allows you almost immediate access to start scanning and start investigating content which is something that you wouldn't want to do if you're going over a wide area network or if your connection speeds aren't very good or if you just have a number of remote offices. So having an agent, an endpoint agent in each of those locations that you can kick off immediately to find what it is that you need to find um, really gets you a lot closer to being able to respond to the short timeframes of the GDPR to know what you're doing. In this case, this particular tool has a number of visualiza visualizations that are specifically geared towards finding and narrowing down a search towards a small collection of content. So this would be, uh, in this case, privacy data, but knowing that it's privacy data that you need to act upon if it's not in a secured folder, uh, if it's owned by somebody in the organization that no longer works for the organization, if it's um, based on a certain type of data, if it's uh, type of format, type of whatever it happens to be, the, the goals of the tool are to help you narrow down that focus as quickly and structurally as possible to allow you to examine, triage, prioritize, and understand your data. Uh, jump to the next slide, please. Like I say we're running out of time. So really what we're trying to do, what Nuix is trying to do to help out KPMG and to help out you uh, in your GDPR efforts is to help you first understand what gaps exist between your, your state of compliance um, and it, compared to the standards required under the GDPR. So if the GDPR requires a certain level of understanding of where your content is and you're not there, that's the gap that we want to help you fill uh, with KPMG's help. Um, but then even more so, once you're there, once you've got control over your data for GDPR, knowing that that data has value for your records managers, for your litigation response, for your risk and security people, uh, for everybody else in your organization, that's really the big message to come out of this. So I've got one summary slide left. This is the summary basically to conclude all the stuff that we've talked about with Nuix. What we want to do to help you with the GDPR more than anything else is understand that you can distribute your deployment of searching capabilities to find the current and its current, the, I'm sorry, find the content in its current state wherever it happens to be uh, across platforms, um, in the cloud, uh, in email systems, wherever they happen to be to get through as much content out of whatever systems you have and as much detail out of that through our number of file formats and the way we get to the content. And then finally, to be able to do something about it when you do find it so that you can protect it, secure it, copy it, move it, delete it, whatever is necessary to meet your specific use case. Um, and beyond that, um, I think that's what we have to say for this presentation. We're gonna transition over to back to Roxana and maybe answer some questions if we can. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, David, uh, Jen. So we do have a number of questions. Let's start off, Michael asks, how do you identify unstructured data on drives, SharePoint, and Outlook? Do you use any industry tools to sniff and identify unstructured data? Anyone on the panel want to take that one? Yeah, I would say that hopefully that's clear after my bit. I'm guessing that that was a question from earlier in the presentation and that we did address that with the variety of notes tools that we have out there because that is specifically and accurately targeted on what we do as a company and how we assist KPMG as part of their methodology. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, and, and kind of just adding on to that, I'm not sure if the question is talking about drives like laptops or actual, you know, endpoints that users have, or is it more like on file structure, um, file shares? Uh, but yeah, as, as Brian had mentioned, there are endpoints that you could do to kind of scan those data. Um, for SharePoint, um, generally we go through the SharePoint administrators, but uh, you could do a crawl with Nuix to uh, identify, uh, I say we go with the SharePoint administrators to get a listing of sites, but then we can point uh, Nuix to uh, scan the SharePoint and then same with uh, Outlook. Thanks, David. So Robin asks, 
How does GDPR affect policies surrounding data breaches? David, do you want to take that one? Well, you know, as Jen had mentioned uh, in the earlier slide, the, you, you know, the GDPR requires breach notification within uh, 72 hours of identification. So in terms of uh, knowing where your data is, um, being able to quickly assess uh, during a incident, uh, having policies to ensure that you can uh, meet those requirements. Um, we actually have a, a project uh, we're going to be on site next week uh, where we're, we're, we're helping a client. They've undergone a breach, um, and we're going to deploy um, our solution out there uh, to identify if any personal information um, was located. It's, it's one of their legacy networks. so. Um, I think that in terms of, you know, if, if we were under GDPR right now, I don't know if they would have necessarily met that breach notification because at this point they don't know if personal data has been uh, uh, compromised or not. That's a great point, David. Hey, um, Roxanne, let me, let me throw in a quick one because I see this in, in our window as well. This is a question from Melinda, if I could real quickly. Sure. Uh, the question was, what do you mean by search hits can be indexed? This is an important part of the SDF that we didn't really necessarily talk about, but the tool, when it's building an index and crawling through your file shares or SharePoints or cloud systems, and it finds something that's responsive to the query that you're looking for, then and only then does it build the index so that you can then, then do further analysis on it. So the idea is you, uh, with that particular tool, that's not true of all the tools, but with that particular tool, uh, you're only capturing data and only indexing stuff that's obviously matching the rules that you've set up to go find in the first place. So rather than index and search, which is typical for all the other products in our industry, this does the search, and if it's responsive, then it indexes and it allows you to do the further uh, depth and analysis that you need to um, without needing to build a massive index or transfer a bunch of data over the network to get to that point. Thanks for that clarification. So it looks like we're at the top of the hour. On behalf of Nuix and KPMG, thank you for attending our webinar. To our panelists, thank you for your time and energy to share your insights and information with us. Please contact us with any questions you might have about GDPR or any other data management issues you have. Have a great day, everyone.